I'm Hallie Spiegel, Campus Director at Camera. I'll keep my remarks brief given the insightful perspectives we have from our student panelists shortly. However, before we delve into that, I want to address some of the deeply concerning incidents unfolding on college campuses over the past five weeks. Some very troubling examples include a UC Davis professor who posted on social media on October 10th the following statement. One group of people we have easy access to in the US is all these Zionist journalists who spread propaganda and misinformation. They have houses with addresses, kids in schools. They can fear their bosses, but they should fear us more. The post ended with emojis depicting a knife, an ax, and drops of blood. A Cornell University professor stated at a rally that he was exhilarated by Hamas's terrorist attack on Israel. At NYU, we saw a law student openly expressing support for Hamas, saying, Israel bears full responsibility for this tremendous loss of life. Shockingly, over 30 Harvard student organizations signed a letter titled, Joint Statement by Harvard-Palestine Solidarity Groups on the Situation in Palestine, where they hold Israel entirely responsible for Hamas's mass slaughter. Recently at MIT, Jewish and Israeli students were physically barred from attending class by a group of pro-Hamas and anti-Israel MIT students. And the list goes on and on and on. The rapid increase in anti-Semitic incidents on college campuses are quite alarming. I do want to mention that there has been success in many places as well, with the defunding, removal, or suspension of specific SJP chapters on campuses such as Brandeis, Columbia, and George Washington University. But unfortunately, the challenges outweigh the successes right now. And that is what we at camera would like to change. But despite these challenges, our students have demonstrated incredible resilience, going above and beyond their expected roles. And now let's hear directly from them. Uh, please welcome Yoni Manor, Sabrina Safer, and Nate Miller. Yoni Manor was a 2022-2023 camera fellow and is currently an undergraduate student studying film and television at Boston University. Yoni was born in Jerusalem and raised in Denver, Colorado. He has a strong bond to the Jewish homeland and the Zionist community here in the United States. In his free time, he enjoys producing podcasts, making short films, and reading. Sabrina Soffer is a current camera fellow at the George Washington University and a philosophy in public affairs and Judaic studies major in the college's honors program. She's a columnist for the Times of Israel and the GW Hatchet and is vice president of Chabad on her campus and is a member of the GW for Israel and a Jewish educational organization, Mayor. And Nate Miller is also a camera fellow and a sophomore at Tulane University. Nate is a student journalist and a proud Zionist who promotes accurate reporting on the Middle East. He currently serves as the president of Tulane's Israel Political Affairs Committee and in the past has interned for JINSA. So thank you all for taking the time out of your busy schedules to be here with us today. I know uh, you all have a lot going on right now, so we really appreciate it. Um, let's begin with Yoni. Yoni, um, Boston University students were one of the first campuses to share the kidnapped posters campaign on campus. And unfortunately, you were also one of the first campuses to witness them being torn down. Um, we want to quickly share a short clip that shows this incident. Are you defending terrorism, really? You guys really are defending terrorism? Fucking cowards. You should be ashamed of yourself. You should be ashamed of yourself. These people are killing innocent civilians. They killed friends of ours. Families, people here are affected directly, and you guys are denying it, taking them out, spreading hate, encouraging anti-Semitism. 
Dude, you literally know I'm Jewish. Like, I've been- That's not really true, that makes it much better. No, but I'm saying, like, you have no right to tell people that their beliefs are wrong or that- It's not a belief. Supporting... No, Condemning fucking Hamas is not a belief. Why you don't have you to believe to think that, that raping someone is wrong. You don't have to believe that someone getting you, kidnapped, that baby's getting this? beheaded, that 85 year old grandmother is getting kidnapped, it's, 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 it's wrong. That's not a belief, that's not an opinion. And if it is, of course, I don't respect it. Why are you filming? Because... What's your point? What? To, to show where the, all of the hate is coming from in this campus. Most Jewish students don't feel safe because a lot of other students are, are, are doing it. And the worst part is that there's Jewish students like you, unfortunately, who like encourage them to continue doing this and they get validated by it. You don't know what... Look, you are reading into propaganda. Know. Sure. Yeah. Hmm? Tell me, You're tell me. You're supporting occupation. An illegal occupation that's been happening for 75 years. It's about years. Hamas and, 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 the, and the atrocities and the, all of the war crimes they're committing. It's not about anything else. You're not condemning terrorists? That shit is wrong. You should be ashamed of yourself. Yoni, I know that she wasn't the only one to tear down posters on campus, but can you tell us a little bit more about this incident um, and what the current atmosphere is like on campus right now? Um, yeah, for sure. So, yeah, unfortunately, that is not the only instance of BU students tearing down um, posters, but um, she was identified and she's actually one of the co-presidents of SJP, ironically enough. Um, she's also led rallies uh, that occurred over the following weeks. But essentially, we have students on our campus uh, like her who just simply do not believe the atrocities that Hamas has committed, despite the overwhelming evidence, of course. Um, and that goes along with all the other mem members in SJP as well. And sort of what we're seeing uh, in the campus atmosphere-wise is uh, this on a large scale. We've posted kidnap posters all across campus. This, just, this was just in one of our buildings. We have videos of, of plenty of other students tearing down uh, posters, and we even have a video of a, a BU faculty uh, member tearing down posters, um, which we are we are currently dealing with. So um, this is not the only thing that we're seeing, obviously, like, you know, just people denying uh, the kidnappings or justifying the kidnappings. Um, but we are seeing outright support for Hamas as a quote unquote resistance group. Um, these are things openly that SJP has stated um, at our campus and, uh, oh, my alarm went off. <laughs> um, and it, it's very troubling to see. Thank you, Yoni, uh, for sharing your thoughts on that. Um, in terms of the faculty, you brought up a really interesting, um, I, I had no idea that you caught faculty as well, pulling down the flyers. Is anything happening with that? Um, yeah, so we, I myself have had uh, a lot of conversations with the administration, the dean of students, president, the provost, you know, the, the top um, officials at the university, and it's mainly been lip service. Um, I haven't spoken to them about this specific incident, but when we brought a plethora of evidence of anti-Semitism on our campus, um, just recently as well, our Hillel building was vandalized with Free Palestine on it as well, which is a very big incident, which BUPD is investigating as a hate crime. So they are taking action on that. But overall, we're seeing them sort of uh, ignore uh, the support, the outright support of terrorism and the incitement of violence against Jews on campus. I mean, previously, even before this war began, we had incidences of uh, SJP stating and writing long lived Antifada. Um, on our campus, Greek Rock, um, which is a direct incitement, uh, violent, uh, a direct incitement of violence against Jews, um, and the administration, uh, the dean of students, pretty much told me bluntly that they don't view it the same way as uh, we do as Jewish students, which is anti-Semitism, of course. And it's kind of a very rare scenario where you know every other minority group is essentially able to define for themselves what is and isn't discriminatory against them, except for Jews, seemingly. Um, and what, what we're seeing is essentially um, our administration uh, refusing to outright condemn specifically anti-Semitism because they are trying to compare uh, our struggles versus uh, Muslim students and Arabic students and Palestinian students saying, oh, there's a rise in Islamophobia as well, trying to like equate the two. Um, when I think it's, 
it's clear that the rise in anti-Semitism is much more drastic and, and more dangerous and concerning, considering the student population as well. It's very Jewish. Right. And how how are the Jewish students feeling with all of this? I mean, I know you're heavily involved in Jewish activity on campus and, and being part of the Israel group on campus. So so what's the the feeling amongst the Jewish students? Feel- yeah, I mean. Um, I would say definitely a lot of fear, but also a lot of strength. I mean, when all of these incidences, they just keep occurring one after another, like it's just been, it's been constant with things happening. We just had like a a massive demonstration blocking off like a main bridge from Boston to Cambridge, um, calling for a ceasefire this morning. Um, So it's really a daily occurrence of incidences that make us as a Jewish community feel unsafe on campus. And when the administration refuses to speak out um, to condemn anti-Semitism, to condemn hatred, to condemn incitement of violence against us, um, it's really disheartening and it makes us feel isolated. But one thing I have noticed is through a lot of the initiatives that we've done as BU Students for Israel and collaborating with other organizations like BU Hillel, uh, Boston Mayor, is we're seeing a, a huge increase in Jewish student engagement and unity among the Jewish community, which is really, we've raised thousands of dollars for Magen David Adom and for uh, Kibbutz near Yitzchak um, to help, directly help, you know, the people in Israel. We've, as I mentioned, posted kidnaps flyers across campus. Um, we've tabled at, you know, the common the common areas at on BU's campus. We've hosted speakers, we've hosted educators, we've hosted a uh, big rally and solidarity and mourning for the Israeli victims. So despite, you know, the outside BU community not, you know, coming to not really supporting us at all, we have we've definitely supported each other. And I've seen a, a major increase um, in that support among the Jewish community. Well, thank you, Yoni, for sharing these thoughts with us. Um, moving down the East Coast to Washington, D.C., uh, Sabrina, you recently appeared on Fox News and News Nation, um, and you spoke to uh, the rally on Tuesday in, in D.C., um, but on Fox and News Nation, you spoke about the recent issues on your campus, and we're going to show a short clip of that coverage. Joining me now is Sabrina Soffer, a Jewish student at GW University and a witness to last night's anti-Semitic incident on campus. Sabrina, what were your first thoughts when you saw those messages about the martyrs of Hamas projected onto that library wall at GWU? Hi, yes. So I'm here actually standing in front of the Gelman Library uh, at the George Washington University in the main square, uh, Kogan Plaza. And I was notified of these um, these slogans while I was coming back from an event. And I was, you know, I was very shocked, but I was not surprised. Sabrina, can you please elaborate with us what happened um, it, with that situation and what the current situation is like at George Washington University and also how this has affected not just you and your safety, but Jewish students in general? Sure. So um, this was, I mean, there's so much that's happened since that incident, but I'll, I'll explain briefly why that's important um, just because this incident really like hit the, the nail in the coffin for the administration. But um, just beginning with that incident, you know, I was, as I said, in the segment, I was walking home from an event where I actually was meeting families of hostages. So it was pretty ironic. Uh, And my friends started texting me pictures of this and they said, you have to come. So I, I came and a lot of Jewish students were already gathered there. And there were some anti-Israel students there as well. Um, but, you know, they were gathered around three students, which eventually became four, who were sitting in front of the library and projecting these uh, hateful messages. Some of them, Palestine from the river to the sea, free Palestine from the river to the sea, um, glory to our martyrs, really euphemisms for uh, eradicating the state of Israel and its Jewry and uh, celebrating mass murder. So, Uh, They were also blaming the university president for being complicit in genocide because the university president uh, condemned Hamas and condemned the SJP for supporting terrorism. So um, 
and that's also important because the admin is really on the Jewish student side, on, or let's just say on the side of, of moral clarity here. Um, but, you know, this this incident, what happened was the uh, we the Jewish students called the police and the admin, uh, somebody from the admin, dean of student life to come and just stay there while we observed. We didn't do anything. Uh, Jewish students just gathered around, wanted to observe. And um, the police came and they said, look, and the, the member of admin said that this is not following school policy. It violates the code of conduct. So you respectfully have to leave. But after a five minute debate, they still wouldn't leave. So one of the students who has now been identified uh, and he's being investigated now, I think, he got up and started chanting uh, free, free Palestine. And the anti-Israel camp veered to one side of the plaza and the Jewish students congregated on the other. And I started like a, I started singing Ose Shalom, like they started singing their free Palestine. So that was the only way to combat it. And it became this singing war between the two of us, which was very powerful. Um, and it really shows the two sides. You have one side singing for peace. You have the other side uh, singing for, for hate and, and genocide of the Jewish people. So um, this was that incident, but a lot has evolved since. And if you want me to to continue, I can I can elaborate more. But this was really that incident. And just to to close this off, um, it wasn't specifically this incident that caused me to feel unsafe for about a week and a half or so. But it was really the escalation that occurred since that incident. Uh, there were a few a few um, demonstrations by the SJP where some uh, came up to me and they said, you know, Sabrina, we know who you are. Stop filming us. There was another incident where um, uh, Palestinian demonstrators came to the ZBT frat house and started waving flagpoles at the brothers so as to strike them. ZBT is a Jewish frat. So knowing that, like, they know who I am. I've been doing this activism in the past. Um so it's if they know me and they're starting to get violent, then I put the pieces together in my head and I say, OK, maybe my mom is right when she tells me to take off my Jewish star. So that was like how it affected my safety. But I have other friends texting me, um, you know, Sabrina, I'm not leaving my dorm. I'm afraid to go to class. I can't walk outside. Uh, you know, for example, just yesterday, there was a rock thrown at a, an, a truck with anti Hamas slogans. So, you know, that could have been one of us. Right. So that's the situation that we have here. Wow. Well, thank you, Sabrina, for sharing um, that insight with us. And I have some follow up questions for you later on. But um, for now, we're, we'll move on to Nate. Um, Nate, on October 26, you did something that many students and, and really many people were inspired by. You saved the Israeli flag from being burned during an anti-Israel rally. Um, and we're now going to show a short clip of that. Nate, can you tell us a little bit about what happened on this day and during this incident and also what is going on on, on Tulane's campus right now? What's the atmosphere like for uh, students and Jewish students? Sure. Um, so last month, a new organization that calls itself Tulane for Palestine suddenly surfaced on Instagram, uh, started posting anti-Semitic, anti-Israel statements and slogans. Before the October 7 attack, this club never existed. Um, so on, on Thursday, October 25th, this club organized a provocative rally on the sidewalk of a public street that runs directly through our campus. Throngs of protesters were, they were chanting anti-Israel slogans, they were chanting from the river to the sea, um, and, and there were references to gas chambers. One of my friends was told uh, to burn in an oven. Uh, on the other side of the street, uh, me and several of the Jewish student leaders uh, were, were gathered. We were similar to what Sabrina was saying. We were singing Ose Shalom and Matis Yahu and those kinds of songs. And uh, uh, to be clear, the protesters on the other side, these were not Tulane students. These were people in their 30s. These were outsiders who came from all over Louisiana, specifically to the most densely populated Jewish area in the entire state, particularly because this is where the Jews live. Um, so as the rally started to intensify, these three men started driving up and down uh, past the protests, 
in that red truck that you saw in the video. And, you know, each time they drove by, they would wave the flag and kind of scream in our faces, you know, intifada, intifada, and rally up like their side, rile people up. Um, on the third time around, one of the men in the back of the truck lifted up an Israeli flag and went to burn it. And I just immediately just charged at the truck and grabbed the flag. Uh, I was battered over the head. I, I had um, a pretty bad, um, I had a big bump on my head. And my friend who jumped in to protect me had his nose broken and got sent to the hospital. We had uh, another girl who was hit, uh, beat pretty badly. So we all got kind of banged up. Um, so I wondered afterwards if I'd done the right thing uh, because, you know, flag burning is a protected right under the First Amendment. But what I, what I started to realize is that there, there's a there's a, a real difference between a genuine political rally and a targeted act of hate. And this was not a, a burning of a flag to for, as a political gesture. This was a targeted act of hate to provoke and intimidate the most densely Jewish neighborhood in all of Louisiana. And they had come to our campus to do that. In the aftermath, me and Dylan, uh, my friend whose nose was broken, sought legal representation. Um, and it turns out uh, the man who hit me over the head with the flagpole is in his 40s, doesn't live in New Orleans, and has a history of making anti-Semitic comments um, and threats. Um, I, I met someone who went to, to who went to school with him back in the day and said that he had once called for the death of all Jews. Um, so these men had come specifically to Tulane, where our student body is 44% Jewish, to intimidate and ultimately attack and physically assault Jews. They were there to, not just to provoke and intimidate, they were there to fight. They came with they, they were ready. I mean, we, we were battered over the head. We were hit with megaphones. This was, I mean, it was, it was, a, it was a riot. Um, I mean, so these men came to our campus specifically to intimidate Jews. And we responded by standing up for ourselves and refusing to be intimidated. And I encourage everyone to stand up against anti-Semitism wherever and whenever you see it. It is important to prioritize personal safety, but sometimes we have to be passionate in our fight against anti-Semitism instead of passive and afraid. Thank you, Nate. Um, a, a follow up question for you. The did it seems like a lot of people you had a lot of support in the moment. Um, after hours after, what was the reaction from your on campus Jewish community? Um, were they supportive? And also, I'm not sure how much you're allowed to say about you know the legal action that's going to be taking place if if that is happening, but. If there is anything you can share, um, can you please share that with us? Sure. Um, so I'll start with the first part of that question. Um, but the strength of Tulane's Jewish community and just the Jewish community in the world is that we will always have each other's backs. We're the only ones who have each other's backs. Um, same with Am Yisrael, uh, the Zionist movement. We we are really there for each other. Um, and I've just never experienced such a moment of unity and just joint moral clarity that we are in a war between good and evil and that we are on the side of good. And like, I think in the history of the Jewish people, there might have, there may have never been such a moment of collective moral clarity that we realize we are on the right side of history fighting on the right side of this war. And, um, uh, and for this, um, the second part of your question, the legal investigations are ongoing, but uh, our lawyer is uh, trying to get this man charged with a hate crime. He's uh, trying to get the DA to charge him with a hate crime. I'm not going to share any specifics of the investigation, but the the evidence against him is pretty damning. And I'm glad to see that they're taking action. Um, Louisiana luckily has a strong community of pro-Israel lawyers who are dedicated to using the rule of law to fight anti-Semitism as well as a civil justice system. And they're working for us pro bono, which is amazing. So just overall, it's just incredible. I never quite realized how much we looked out for one another until a few weeks ago. Wonderful. And um, Nate, in terms of like, I, you were saying that most of the protesters were actually from outside of Tulane's campus. Has Have there been other incidents where they were involved? And, and do you think that the anti-Israel students that are on Tulane's campus are, um, you know, inspired by their work and, and are influenced by the com the outside community's uh, anti-Israel sentiment? Yeah, I mean, don't get me wrong. There are a number of Tulane students who are involved in, in the these rallies, but the vast majority, the people with the megaphones, the people with the signs, the people who come from outside in these trucks, none of them are Tulane students. There are a few Tulane students 
students assembled among them who are empowered by them. But um, just last week, these protesters came back to our campus where they marched from our campus to a synagogue where they stopped outside of the synagogue and started screaming about Intifada. Um, not only that, but they also got on the megaphone and said, Nate Miller, a Zionist teenager, a, Z or a Zionist student at Tulane University assaulted a Palestinian teenager. This is a this is a battle. This is an information war that is being fought, and the other side is 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 twisting and distorting reality to serve their narrative, and it is it is shocking, and and we need to call attention to it, and we need there needs to be a probe into these groups to see where their money is coming from. Why why is the Qatari government giving billions of dollars to, to all of these colleges? Where is the money coming from for these protests? Where, where do these groups get their money from? We need an immediate probe into into their into their source of funding because it's it's really it's really concerning and shocking. I I think we all agree with you, Nate, on that. Um, well, thank you for sharing, and and also thank you for everything you did on that day. I, I truly, when I I say this, I I mean it. I think many people were inspired by your actions. So, thank you, um, Sabrina. You seem to be very well connected to students from all over the country. Um, seeing you at our conference and in different group chats, uh, you seem to know a lot of students. So I was curious after speaking with these students, especially over the past five weeks, what are some ways that they're fighting back to combat the lies and misconceptions about Israel that they hear on campus? Yeah, so I think every campus is different. And I think it's really important to remember that like for whatever, whenever we're discussing this. Um, so, you know, my friends at, um, like, let's say at uh, UCLA, for example, like they're at Stanford, I'm sorry, they're facing a lot of issues with the administration. So what they've done is they've compiled a folder of all the evidence from the SJP and all their rallies and all the faculty issues, like with the classroom, you know, where, where faculty are making really egregious remarks and they're compiling them into into folders so we can get these investigations going swiftly and smoothly um at gw we're doing that too and quite frankly i think that everybody should be doing that i know lawsuits are another way to fight back i don't think that that's necessarily critical at gw at this point in time i think the real distinction here is like are the administrators on the side of moral clarity if they are great work with them and try to get them to influence the way faculty is composed, right? Like we have a Middle East Institute studies program that is extremely anti-Semitic. Um, you know, they showed a screening of the film Israelism. They had a panel with five different experts that were all anti-Israel and either justifying or supporting the actions of Hamas. And this was like two weeks after the war started. So I mean, this is the situation at GW. We're, of course, like doing huge Shabbats, inviting Jews and non-Jews. We're doing tefillin wrapping in the plaza. Uh, we're recording videos like students are going on the news. We're writing articles, um, you know, there and there's a lot of other ways that we're we're fighting back. You know, singing Hatikva is one form of, of doing so as well. So, again, like different campuses different ideas. I know students, my friend Talia Dror from Cornell, she testified in the Ways and Means Committee yesterday. Um, the girl from Columbia, Noah Faye, who I spoke alongside at the rally, she's facing a really terrible situation at Columbia. But now, since their SJPs have gotten banned, their groups are gaining more leverage. So I think that it's important. Um, I know it's not, this is not a direct response to your question. But it's really important to, yes, gain knowledge from students on other campuses, but be careful not to conflate what's going on on other campuses with your own because it can really cause a lot more damage. And I'll end with this, like because you asked about or you, you spoke about SJP being banned from GW, you know, maybe that's a good thing at Columbia. But at GW, it wasn't executed properly. And now we're facing the repercussions of it. And now they're. They created a new uh, anti-Israel coalition with it's bigger and better and louder than la than it was with the SJP. And the, the administration gave no explanation as to why the SJP was banned. And I know they meant it with good intent, but, you know, I might have said and I, I would say that in principle, it's a good thing. But execution matters and we have to really be nuanced when we go about um, fighting back. So that's. 
I'm I'm curious to hear a little bit more about that actually because it's a it's a question I wanted to ask later on. But it, you know, at GW, I, I think what was it that the SJP was suspended for three months, correct? Yeah, ninety days. Yeah, ninety days. So can you tell us a little bit about like how that decision was made, and then you know, for you, you're you're expressing that you were actually not happy with that situation in how it's currently playing out on your campus. So can you tell us a little bit more about why that is? Yeah. So the library projections were like what hit the nail on the head with with getting SJP banned because it was a deliberate violation of school policy in the handbook. Um, a week later after, or actually, yeah, it was, I think, four days later, the a SJP student broke into the Hillel building and tore down our hostage posters from the inside. So that was another slash. And according to our student code of conduct, it doesn't matter which community gets attacked. It matters which group is perpetrating the attack. So the more strikes that group has, the easier it is to get them held accountable. So ultimately, with like everything SJP has been doing over the past five weeks, um, this it, they put enough tallies in their um you know, on in their box to get them suspended. And this isn't, you know, th to mention the the rallies that they've organized and what they're saying, like all the hateful messaging, like the content really doesn't matter. Like the free speech principle still holds, but it's just the way that these free speech, hate speech, whatever you want to call it, is being executed and escalating into acts of, of hate, like Nate, like Nate's situation, right? It's, this is a clear incitement of violence and they escalate. But, um, when when the SJP got banned, I think that when students, especially the 80 percent who don't know about what's going on, right, they, they're they not informed. They don't know whether this is hate speech or free speech. They're not commenting, but they're just seeing, oh, the school bans SJP. Then it's really going to look like what the SJP is saying. They're going to say, oh, yeah, it's a GW is a Zionist propaganda machine. They're only on the sides of the Zionists and they're not explaining why. So this is only what we're left to assume. So it's it's very dangerous. And I think that's something that Nate said is very important and that should be uh, investigated by all university administrations is that I've done a lot of digging into this as well. And I think Noah Tishby, when she testified yesterday, she spoke about it too, is that these organizations, their funding comes literally, like it, it indirectly traces to Hamas. The money from Qatar also has that influence because there are Hamas leaders sitting in Qatar right now. So if there can be a report that's publicized by these university administrators who are supportive of the Jewish community and they're aired to the Jewish community and beyond, this can start setting the precedent for why SJP needs to be banned, not only on individual campuses, but we can do it for the whole country. Right. And then from that point of view, when they are banned, um, you know, students will have a better understanding of of the reason behind it. But then, you know, students like you and like Nate and like Yoni can write about this in their campus paper and and really break it down for students. Um, I understand what you're saying. I, I I see totally how this can affect the other eighty percent of of students who are like, well, that's you know what they they um, they're claiming. But at the same time, it's also nice to have such a hate group not be able to spew anything for at least night or you know three well months. they can that's the thing they are like yesterday they literally organized a rally that was two and a half hours long and marched directly to the president's house and they were singing like grandberg grandberg we know you you're complicit in genocide too this is this is a direct result of them being banned because they're upset with her so they did they are and the thing is you know maybe they should have they should have said we're not allowing you to organize and anybody who organizes is going to be expelled. That's great. Do that. But they didn't do that. They just said SJP is suspended for 90 days. That's, you know, what does that mean? They have to say suspended from what? So yeah, sorry to interrupt, but it's, it's important. No, no. I'm, I'm glad that you're, you're explaining that, that difference because um, it, it does, it makes sense. And um, 
we saw the same thing at Brandeis, even though they were banned, they still did gather together um, in an unofficial capacity. So it's something I, you know, that I think our whole team is on this call right now as well. So it's something we're hearing and, and we're taking notes on and, and we want to do something about and hearing from you and Nate on this. It's uh, really important to us. So thank you. And on that note with SJP, um, Yoni, you know, as a camera fellow, you covered the lies that SJP has exposed on campus and how they propagate their lies and propaganda to the campus community. Um, can you tell us a little bit historically how Students for Justice in Palestine has operated on Boston University's campus? Yeah, for sure. Um, previous to the war, um, we were thankful to have a, a pretty small SJP chapter, not as violent and outspoken, so to speak, as other universities. However, um, they they did do some very outspoken things. Um, for instance, I think it was December of 2021, they graffitied our uh, campus Greek Rock, which sits in the center of campus with Long Live the Intifada, uh, a call to violence against Jews. The administration did nothing about this back, what was that, two years ago? Um, they also um, trespassed on BU property by going to the roof of our College of Arts and Sciences building and put and basically flung a massive banner saying free Palestine and and end the deadly exchange because BUPD has done training with Israeli police officers um, in, in the past. So and, you know, they've been constantly uh, they've been tabling for years. They, they have weekly meetings, this and that, where they essentially just spew very misleading propaganda. They've done apartheid weeks um, where they put up their, you know, little apartheid wall like many other college campuses do um, with just, you know, the basic slogans that we always hear, the one, two word phrases, white supremacy, apartheid, colonialism, when in fact, many, many members in BU Students for Israel and just Jewish students have approached these members of SJP. And when we try to, you know, just, just to gauge what their their stances are exactly they they really have zero knowledge on the issue they they know zero history they don't even know the basic historical terms and and events that we uh, we ask them about um it, it's very much uh, a trendy um sort of movement where it's uh, all the bad words you hear genocide apartheid and they have been spewing this um very relentlessly uh, now via social media, um, you know, organizing or being a part of uh, several rallies across Boston. Boston has seen a lot of different um, uh, rallies in that capacity. And it is very concerning to see them ramp up their, their very misleading rhetoric. Um, but yeah, I covered a few of, uh, of their events as a camera fellow, wrote articles, um, one of which was published in the Daily Free Press, the Beast of Newspaper. But once again, this is another issue that we see. We see a lot of, for instance, uh, our student government, Pat, the first thing they did when uh, after the attacks of October 7th, they didn't you know, release a statement condemning terrorism or anything. The first thing they did was uh, endorse a fundraiser that was led by SJP and signed by uh, 30 other uh, clubs and you know various student organizations um, for a fundraiser for Palestinian children. And like, although, you know, who knows where this money is going, obviously, as it's being funneled to Gaza. But um, just the fact that that was the first thing they would do in a, in a, at a school with a population that's almost a quarter Jewish, it was it was pretty remarkable. I mean, not remarkable, but very disheartening um, to see. And, and we see, you know, this the impact that their misleading rhetoric is having in terms of influencing uh, student government and just also students in, that are clueless. Like I would say, you know, 80 percent of the student body before October 7th really doesn't know much about the conflict in general, right? And it's easy to, when you call out that there's a genocide, everyone's like, whoa, that, that is bad. Everyone knows what genocide is, but they, they don't really look into it deeply. And so we've been focusing on, you know, debunking these myths like systematically through tabling, uh, through our events, through our speakers, um, through doing public initiatives like that. So uh, it's, it's a tough battle, but um, that's kind of what we're seeing on our campus. Well, thank you, Yoni for sharing that and and thank you Sabrina and Nate as well for sharing all of this information it's truly incredible to see students standing up proudly on campus for Israel like all of you so thank you and i know there are a lot of questions already coming in from the audience um, but before we get to q and a 
I would like to speak about what we at CAMERA are doing to help students like Yoni, Sabrina, and Nate combat misinformation and to stand up against hatred, bigotry, anti-Zionism, and anti-Semitism. So we work strategically campus by campus in two main ways that are unique to CAMERA. First, we support independent pro-Israel groups that are not under the umbrella of any national organization. These groups are often the most creative, unafraid, and willing to stand up in a crisis. We bring to bear CAMERA's 40 plus years of research in refuting lies and bias against Israel and in writing and activism about the conflict and the media that reports on it. So just as CAMERA's core mission is rooted in the conviction that lies about Israel have to be refuted so that Americans are not misled about the Jewish state, we also believe this applies on campus and we teach this to our students. In fact, we urge our students to be the first to stand up in defense of Israel, to let everyone know it can be done, and to be a model for others. And we're currently supporting dozens of Israel groups across North America, Canada, the United Kingdom, and Israel. And these are not camera groups, but they have their own names and brand, and we fund their efforts. So we do have requirements in return, including that the group sponsor factually reliable speakers and activity and counter anti-Israel issues. We provide significant funding, materials, high profile speakers, and an in, a team of in-house researchers to address the many critical issues that arise. Our team is available for one-on-one -on -one support 24 seven, which I'm sure Nate, Yoni, and Sabrina have utilized in some capacity during their time as camera fellows. Um, in addition to supporting Israel groups, we also recruit and support nearly 60 individual camera fellows who become the eyes and ears on their campus when it comes to Israel. They monitor their campus paper, sometimes multiple campus papers and local papers. Camera fellows contribute to their own columns in the campus paper, and they are typically the first to respond to a distorted anti-Israel article. They also respond to the falsehoods and ant that anti-Israel students and professors on their campus spread, and they educate their student body with the facts. They do this through hosting speakers, putting on themed tabling on their campus quad, writing articles in their campus paper, and answering questions that their peers may have. And they also lead in responding to anti-Israel events on campus. So when needed, we can quickly create tailored flyers and infographics for students to share with their peers and questions for them to ask of controversial speakers. Our camera fellows write on average around 100 op-eds each year, published in campus, local, and national outlets. They address and respond to many issues being brought up on campus. And so we're proud of them, and we are here to support them however they need. And just to briefly give a quick overview of what our department has been up to over the past five weeks since October 7th, we launched our SJP Expose campaign to expose the hateful and anti-Semitic lies and pro-Hamas propaganda spread by Students for Justice in Palestine. Since October 8th, our campaign uh, infographics, protest banners, and articles have been accessed by over 12,000 unique visitors. And just last week, we added a SJP toolkit to our website where students now have resources to speak up to their administrations about the issues of SJP on campus. Um, members of the camera on campus team continue to attend rallies and demonstrations in support of Jewish students on campus and Israel's battle against Hamas, as well as distributing camera on campus infographics and educational materials to combat anti-Semitic propaganda. Our students are routinely reporting about intensifying anti-Semitism on campus and providing vital coverage to mainstream and Jewish news outlets. And our staff, our staff have published many articles and we've released multiple press releases and have held emergency briefings for our students, which I think have been helpful and, and useful. So a lot has been done, but as we've discussed on this call, there's a lot more to do. So with that, I know there are many questions from the audience, um, and I'm sorry, we're not going to be able to get to all of them, but we're going to try our best to get to as many as we can. Um, so let's jump into that. Um, all right. So the first question I see here is, what advice would you give high school students who are about to face this environment when they enter college, and how should they prepare themselves? Um, Sabrina, can you answer this question for us? 
Yeah, sure. So that's actually it's it's great that I'm answering this question because when my parents um, in high school took me to a lecture about anti-Israel activity on college campuses, I knew I was going to GW, which is like GW, you know, lots of Jews. I didn't believe them and I didn't pay attention. So um, definitely going to events if they are available in people's cities, districts, wherever it may be, please do attend because it's important that students are prepared before they go in. Like for me now, like I'm less, even though the situation has intensified because I already know what it is like to be threatened by the SJP. I'm not as afraid like my fellow peers who are afraid to leave their dorms because they've never seen or experienced or known about this before. And obviously anti-Semitism is a rising trend and like so like together with this anti-Israel rhetoric, um, but not knowing not only how to defend yourself with facts, but also knowing what's behind these SJPs and what's knowing behind BDS knowing how to talk assertively and respectfully to faculty and administration, knowing how to document and report incidents, how to get in touch with lawyers, the different Jewish organizations that exist, finding your Hillel or Chabad on campus, the first thing you do when you get there. I think those are like the most important tools because truly like I have become quite a major advocate in the space and without the community, like I wouldn't be here today. I wouldn't be able to do what I do. I would be scared. So um, that's the advice I would give. Thank you for sharing that. I, I think that's really important because oftentimes I get the question asked to me, well, where can I send my child or grandchild? What, what's the least anti-Semitic university? And I'm like, well, first of all, that changes, you know, from year to year, day to day, hour to hour. But besides that, it's really important that we're, you know, educating our children and our grandchildren um, and and giving them the resources they need so that they could be strong leaders on their campus and fight back against this. Um, so I think everything, you know, I agree completely with everything you had to say, and, and thank you for sharing that. Um, but, you know, so for some students, this is a question that I, I came across, and I think it actually ties in really well here. You know, for some students who might not be as active or vocal as the three of you, um, but they're just as committed and passionate and, you know, maybe they're wary of, for a variety of reasons, um, from a hostile campus environment to simply having a more introverted personality, what role can these students play and how can we empower them to help make a difference? Um, so maybe all three of you could briefly speak on this and, and we can start with Nate. Sure. Um, so I would say do what you can. I understand that safety is an issue and that's, that's a priority. At the same time, I encourage people to not be afraid and not be intimidated because that's what they want. And to remember that we are on the right side of history and we are the ones defending Western values, personal freedoms and human rights. Um, I, I, there, there are ways other than, you know, writing off ads even or grabbing flags or or advocacy to, to get involved in this kind of stuff. Simply attending Jewish or pro-Israel events, being there for your friends and family, being there for your Jewish friends is is just as big of a deal as publishing op-eds. Um, obviously people have different strengths and like uh, some, I mean, organizing events, attending events. I understand that Zionists have targets on their back right now, but we we just can't let that stop us from doing what we do. We have to we have to love what we do more than anyone hates it. Thank you, Nate. Uh, Yoni, Sabrina, do you have anything that you guys would like to add? Um, yeah, I could I could speak briefly on that. Um, you know, I I feel as though October seventh, despite the 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 horrors and atrocities that occurred um one silver lining in it is that it has really inspired people and it has made jewish students feel more proud uh to be jewish than ever before and i think we all need to take advantage of this just this newfound passion this newfound unity within our jewish communities and encourage students to to step up and speak out and and, uh, and as nate said you know it doesn't mean uh, if they if they, if they don't feel safe, everyone has personal safety preferences, and you definitely should not push others on that. But whatever people are comfortable with, they they should do. Whether it's even just posting something on social media, everyone has non-Jewish friends, right? We all have non-Jewish followers, even if we are 
very involved in our Jewish circles, you know, I just having one-on-one conversations with our non-Jewish friends, like I've had, it's been really impactful and it's really made me feel better, you know, for them supporting me, but it's also been, I think, insightful uh, for them and those that I've had conversations with, like being able to, to spread the word to not only our community, because obviously our community is very um, unified in this moment, um, but to spread, to spread our arms and to, to bring other people in, because if we don't, it's just going to be more and more hatred against us rather than supporting us. And I, and I think I've seen that and like, you know, just getting people involved, like Nate said, to just get people to events, they don't have to, you know, plan a huge rally, but just to come to Shabbat dinner, just to, just to have people feel more Jewish, even if it isn't directly related to Israel. Cause I promise you, like when you become more involved in your Judaism, you become more involved in Israel and you become more connected to it. Cause you know, it's, it's our Jewish homeland. So I feel like even just the little things will, will add up and, and create a better situation for us all. Great. Thank you, Yoni. Sabrina, anything to add to that? You can, I, that was really well said. You can move on. I'll, I can take the next question if, Great. Okay. So uh, let's see here. Another question. Uh, here's one that I, I keep seeing a, a bit about as well. So uh, people keep asking, what resources do you think Jewish students need most from Jewish organizations or the wider Jewish community in order to effectively advocate for Israel and the Jewish people on their campuses? That's a great question. Um, I think different organizations have different strengths. Um, I can speak like I'm the chair of Hillel International's content creators program. And what we did is created a group chat with over like 300 students from colleges across the country. And I send a newsletter with articles that could be helpful for students um, two to three times a week. Um, Students plug their social media posts in this group chat um other students will ask for help um you know to other students from other campuses who are experiencing similar things so i think that digital communities digital spaces and it's really easy like this doesn't take any money you know it takes it's like a five second task to just start a group chat um that's really really important And then another thing I would say is definitely like funding for events and making sure that there's security at these events, because a lot of the times like on these like DC is great because we have like the Secret Service, like right, because DC is in the middle. So we're we're good. But I think for a lot of campuses that are like in really like rural or suburban areas, uh, security is really important. Just getting people in touch with the top notch Israel oriented speakers who Like there are, you know, not every speaker is of the same caliber. So I think that now because we have this great opportunity, like Yoni was saying, bringing in speakers like I think Einat Wilf is a prime example of somebody who is an expert in this. And she would be great to bring um, to campuses right now. People from the IDF doing events with IDF officials, really important. Trying to get Palestinians involved in this. A lot of the Palestinians on GW's campus actually aren't even in SJP because they think it's too extreme. So that says a lot. Um, But just like trying to dig deep into the dynamics of your campus and seeing what your campus needs and then reaching out to the Jewish organizations um, and via like digital circles that are created from them. Okay, well, thank you for that. And um, unfortunately, I'm looking at the time now, we are out of time for Q&A. And I know there were a lot of questions that we weren't able to get to. So please know I do plan to share these questions with our panelists and our team, um, because I do think a lot of them are really important. So thank you again. I, I, I again like to thank Yoni, Sabrina, and Nate for taking the time out of their busy, busy schedules to be here with us. In addition, to doing all of this work that they're doing as activists, they are also students and finals are coming up and they in midterms and they have a lot of studying to do. So thank you guys for being here with us. And I want to thank our audience who are watching as well. Your <clears throat> support means the world to us and makes our work possible. We're busy on many fronts. We're working in the Arab media, the Spanish media, the British media, and of course in the North American media, but also on college and high school campuses. And of course, there's a hurricane of problems in all of those areas. So we're grateful for your support and we ask you to continue supporting as much as possible during this crisis. 
and also to get your friends and colleagues who are not familiar with camera to join you. If you hear from people who are upset about biased media coverage, upset about what's going on on college campuses, well, they could help do something about it. They can join camera and help us correct the record. They can help our work on college and high school campuses. They can join our media response team, which is our volunteer team of letter writers who protest inaccuracies in the media and in schools. Many letters to the editor, which you see in major newspapers around the world, are actually from people who are part of our letter writing team, who receive our alerts, and who participate in campaigns and our campaigns to improve media coverage. So to join, they can quickly sign up by emailing my colleague, Sarah Miller, at smiller at camera.org. Sarah will get them quickly signed up to receive our alerts and action items, which is powerful. And it's a powerful way to help combat media disinformation in this hour of need. And so we also hope that you'll consider making a donation to our organization so that we can keep our programs and campaigns going strong and so that we can keep fighting. To donate, just go to camera.org and you'll see a big red button there where you can make a gift, which we would very much appreciate. In any case, we thank you again for taking the time to be with us here today. And I wish you and your loved ones a good and healthy, safe day. And that will conclude our program.